Hi, everybody, and welcome to Deep in the Bush. Joining me today is Simon Naylor, who is the Conservation Manager at and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. So must have a business card about the size of a roadside billboard to fit all those words in. Um, he's a man of great experience who's worked in some of the fa most fantastic wildlife areas in both Southern and East Africa. So brings a unique perspective to the conservation challenges. But before we jump into that, let's get to know, get to know Simon a bit better. Um, starting with a few standard questions we have for a lot of our guests here. Simon, given the choice of taking an animal superpower, be it being able to run like a cheetah, um, age like a tortoise, what would you choose? What would what would you go for? Yeah, hi Peter, nice to nice to be here and um, great talking to you. Uh, yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Um, you know, there's there there's, there are so many animal superpowers out there, and uh, I I, I kind of gave it some thought. Um, and and I, it might sound a bit uh, sort of uh, boring, but I think to see in the dark, um, you know, a lot of a lot of our work uh, is done at night, um, whether it's sort of research or you know ecological sort of work or or on the security side. You know, we spend quite a bit of time out at night, and uh, we've had some amazing encounters. Um, some of them too close, you know, too close for comfort with things like hippos and lions and, yeah. and uh, yeah, it would have just been awesome to have seen them, you know, and, and there's so much that goes on out there that we can't see. So I guess, I guess the superpower would be, you know, the eyes of a, of an owl or, um, you know, just something like a Janet, you know, they've got incredible yeah. eyesight at night. Um, yeah. That, that's what I would sort of want, you know, is just to see a different world. You know, we, 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 um, we see the daytime so much and, the nighttime is just sort of so dark to us and we have to rely on our ears because we can't really see much. So, yeah, that's what I would choose, huh? Yeah, I think that's amazing. And nobody's given that answer and I, I like it because I've obviously spent a lot of time on night safaris as well. But in the day, it's as if you're watching an IMAX. Yeah. And at night, it's as if you've had the blinkers put on because yeah. it's wherever the, the spotlight might be traveling or your headlights. I'm sure yeah. you've just spent time driving through the bush and it's just... The animals make cameos as opposed to the long, long scene. Um, but I was—I realized uh, I was going to entirely read past and say, "Welcome to the show." Welcome to the show, son. No, thank you. <laughs> no, guys, straight in. <laughs> this is what lockdown has done to me. Uh, any yeah. any pretense of civility is gone. We're talking about wild lockdown here. This is, you know, thank God they'll deliver gloopy stuff, uh, not. Gwyneth Paltrow stuff, but this is just whatever I could pack on because I'm looking somewhere between Einstein and Boris Johnson with, <laughs> unfortunately, the intelligence skewing a hell of a lot lower. Um, okay, so here's one that I don't think you were ready for. There's a headline in the paper and it says, Simon Naylor, dot, dot, dot. What would you like that to read? What would you like to make news for? Um, well, yeah, hopefully all the right reasons, um, because I think, you know, these days you can definitely get in the news for the wrong reasons. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think it would be something obviously to do with conservation and, and wildlife and, um, you know, having a, an impact, you know, in, in I guess it could be, you know, achieving something that, that you know, is, is, is perhaps hard to do or, uh, or challenging or, or something quite unique, you know. And um, look, I'll be honest; I'm not one for for the news, uh, and and certainly, um, I, I always like to sort of uh, promote the team spirit and the teamwork that uh, that goes around. And um, you know, I think I think perhaps um, you yeah, are changing the course of of history of a species. You know, like like what we've done. I guess what we've sort of managed to achieve here. Uh, at Pinder, you know, is to sort of reintroduce these pangolins. Um, I think that's that's definitely newsworthy, and and I think if 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 I would have to be in the news, it would be sort of something for a good story like that, you know. And and uh, but certainly not not for what for for what I've done, but certainly um, sure. you know for what a, a team has done. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you, you prefer to be in the Avengers as opposed to standalone. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd, I prefer not to be in the news. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't imagine if I am ever in it that it's going to be <laughs> yeah, yeah. anything other than, than scandal. Um, you've actually you've touched on something now. I, I wanted to bring up later, but we can jump into now the introduction or reintroduction, I should say, of yeah. penguins into Pinder. Uh, you're far better placed than I am to describe the and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. Can we just call it Pinder from now on? Are we okay? We, we... Yeah, we can, yeah. <laughs> if, if you're far better to describe, uh, give a potted history of that area, and mm. I think it is quite pioneering in what it's managed to achieve. So would you be able to tell mm. people what Pinder is? Yeah, well, I think Pinder is a quite a remarkable story. Um, you know, South Africa... I think probably before most of, of the rest of Africa went through a, a period where a lot of the, the sort of big game got, got shot out, you know, in the, in the 1800s. And, and then the settlers arrived, you know, the, uh, the British and the Dutch. Um, and they, they really took over a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of South Africa. And so a lot of the wildness of South Africa disappeared quite, quite early on. Um, you know, unlike I think most of West Africa and East Africa, um, you know, and so, you know, farmers settled the land, you know, they, they shot everything out and they plowed it all up. And, um, and so this area of Zululand, although there was, you know, quite a few sort of natural areas left, you know, the famous, um, you know, Shishli and Falozi and Mkuzi, um, there wasn't much else, you know, there wasn't much else wildlife, uh, left, left sort of in the 1950s. Um, Pinder itself was, Cattle farms, um, pineapples. Uh, there was some hunting here, and uh, sarsel. You know, I think that the farmers had tried everything. You know, um, that they could. So it was really, um, I, I, it was really tamed. You know, and um, so so in the ninety early nine or late eighties, um, you know, things started to change politically. Um, there was some really bad droughts. Um, you know the farmers struggled. You know they 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 couldn't make ends meet, and um, so land was was up for sale. And and there was a couple of individuals um, that saw a vision in sort of bringing back the wildness, and at the same time, with the with the hopes of of international tourism, and you know uh, wildlife tourism also was very new. I think to Southern Africa then there weren't many private reserves, or you know you could go, and I did as a child. You could go and camp in a park but you know there weren't luxury lodges or game drives or things like that so it's worth mentioning as well at that point almost all of the tourism was domestically sourced there were sanctions against yeah. south africa yes so <clears throat> apart from the uk i think there was a free flow of tourism there but as an american or as an australian wherever you might be from in the world you needed to give a good reason to visit south africa yeah. plead to your government so yeah, yeah. yeah, there wasn't a lot of scope for that international tourism. Well, there wasn't any, you know, and and so mm -hmm. the vision was quite visionary, you know, at the time, mm -hmm. and um, you know now it's a it's it's common everywhere, you know, safaris and lodges, and there's 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 a hundred game reserves, private reserves that have been sort of restocked uh, in South Africa and and other places as well. But yeah, so Pinda started in 1990, and and um, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, a game reserve was born, and uh, animals were reintroduced. Things like elephants and lions and cheetahs, and you know there was there was some there was some animals here. You know the smaller antelopes and yeah. leopards and hyenas and uh, crocodiles and a few hippos in the river, but most things had to sort of be brought back and and reintroduced and rewilded, um, and um, so that's kind of the story of Pinda, and then and then obviously. You know, luxury lodges were built, and and a tourism business was created, and and obviously the community involvement has been uh, has been very um, heavy uh, right from the beginning. You know, it's um, you know the the there were local people living here at the time, and and obviously uh, back in the sort of early 1900s, there were local people, local you know Zulu people and Tongas uh, living on the land here as well. So and they were sort of pushed out uh, during the. Uh, the early South African uh, nationalist sort of government uh, years and the British years yeah. as well. So, so that's how Pinda started. Yeah? Um, and it's been, you know, we're celebrating the 30 years uh, uh, history of, of Pinda this year. Um, so it's been a, a remarkable story, you know, just to get it also to, to, to make it profitable. Um, I mean, it is a business and it's a tourism business. 
Um, but it, it it's a model that was fairly remarkable. It was visionary and uh, it's been managed. You know, we've achieved uh, what 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 the vision was. So that's kind of the, it's, the quick summary. Yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, the, <clears throat> you're mentioning it, it being profitable because conservation so often is portrayed as a, 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 a bottomless pit. You're just going to yeah. throw money, resources, time, personnel at it. And you're never going to touch bottom. But the idea that you could take farmland that was non-productive, as you said, drought prone, <clears throat> and I don't know how many years it took to be profitable, but to turn it around, I mean, what a, a great thing to invest in rather than Bitcoin or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. This is actually improving the planet, yeah. uh, letting wildlife run free. And I've, I've spoken frequently about the value of wildlife, even if you're not interested in animals. Uh, which is a whole other uh, uh, rabbit hole we could go down. But um, coming back to the pangolins, so they'd presumably been wiped out during the agricultural years. There was just no habitat for them or were there still a few clinging on and you felt there needed to be more? What what spurred that on? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a no one really knows, to be honest. Uh, there's, you know, there's, uh, the, the exact causes are not known. Um you know, the last sort of sightings in this area, on this land, were in 1980. There was um, a sighting not far from here. Um, and some of the, the sort of old inhabitants of the farms that I've spoken to recall seeing pangolins, you know, in the early 30s, 40s, you know, but they would see them sort of crossing the road at night. And um, yeah. I think, you know, as you know, pangolins are, well, certainly the Temex ground pangolin is is a sort of a scarce creature anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, I think they 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 occurred here for sure, but maybe not in such great numbers. Um, and uh, you know, when we when we were talking to some of the sort of older Zulu inhabitants, you know, and asking them about pangolins, they recalled seeing pangolins here in the fifties and sixties. And um, I think I think they they went sort of locally extinct because um, you know farming with with fences and um, mm. pesticides and and you know, a lot of the land was plowed up here. Uh, they just ran out of habitat, ran out of food. Yeah. I think they were also collected. Um, you know, the pangolin in, in Zulu culture is is probably one of the most um, high-valued or esteemed gifts that you can give a chief or a king. And, um, you know, I, I would imagine, you know, people would have been wandering the, the felt or the, the bush and come across a pangolin. They would have picked it up and they would have taken it to the king uh, they would have eaten it. Um, it was sort of quite sought after for mm -hmm. traditional medicine as well. So I think slowly as time marched on and, and the land was sort of settled and occupied, they just sort of disappeared. And um, there were some reports of pangolins in Mkuzi Game Reserve, which is next door to us, um, which is mm -hmm. quite a large protected area, a very old protected area. Um, but I think those were sort of scragglers, you know, old, old individuals and no one really knows when the last viable population was. Um, I would imagine it's 50, 60, 70 years ago, you know, and there's been some sporadic records up on the Mozambique border, which is not far from here, um, but nothing in this area. So, you know, so the reintroduction. In context, you're, you're in South Africa, Republic of yeah. South Africa, in the northeast. How far are you from the coast? We are not far. We're about sort of 15 kilometers as the crow flies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then north of us is uh, Mozambique, which is about an hour's drive. So it's about 100 kilometers. And then we've got sort of Swaziland. Yeah, now we know how um, fast you I drive fast, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Swaziland is at about 11 o'clock of us, you know, if you're kind of looking at a clock, you yeah. know. So we, we, we're sort of below Kruger, below Swaziland, below Mozambique, but, but north of, of Durban. And then... You know, the coast is very much, uh, well, it, the, the Indian Ocean is very close to us. Yeah. So it's a subtropical system, yes. you know, unlike yeah. the crude, which is, I think, very, you know, you know, the, the acacia woodlands is what you think of with that. This has got uh, more of a, I don't want to say yeah. a sweaty, but that undersells it, but you've, you've got like the coastal <laughs> influence on it, don't you? The, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, our summers are hot and humid, um, yeah. you know, very similar to, Tanzan, you know, the east coast of Tanzania and Kenya, uh, Mozambique, um, 
you know, temperatures sort of get up into the high thirties and uh, yeah, it's pretty sweaty here um, yeah. in, in, but in it's, January, it's, it's, February. It's, it's the satisfaction of that, I get it. <clears throat> I know a lot of people don't, but um, I want to jump back to the pangolins for a bit. Um, yeah. as I know that you were a big part of that project. Uh, and I'm sure you'll, you'll humbly say part of the team with it. Aside from the pangolins that you have um, uh, been released and, and presumably tracked, yeah. how often have you seen just a free roaming wild pangolin in, in however many countries you've worked in, which is at least four that I've, I've got from your biography, you know, Tanzania, yeah. Kenya, Botswana, South Africa, some of the key wildlife areas on the planet. How many yeah. have you seen? wandering around um before before we started here introducing i'd only seen one before in in botswana um on a safari actually um and uh it was in the savuti and we sort of came around a corner and there was this sort of pangolin on the side of the road already in a ball you know it was um wrapped up and and i mean our guide had never seen one before and I'd never seen one. I was quite young. Um, and we all jumped out and, you know, approached this pangolin. And, you know, it was in a ball. You know, we was obviously, I mean, knowing pangolins, I knew it was alive, but it didn't move. Um, we, we were there for about five, ten minutes. Um, and we left it, it. It was still rolled up in a ball. And we sort of left, left it yeah, because, you know, it was quite clearly stressed and, uh, it wasn't going to unravel for us. Um, you know, we were surrounding it and touching it, and which is probably wasn't the best thing to do back back then. But I'd only ever seen one before. So, um, and I mean, I'm I've been I've kind of worked in the in the bush for 30 years now. I've you know spent a lot of time driving around and walking around and moving around at night, and that I'd never seen one else before, other than that one time in Botswana. So, yeah, yeah they're pretty rare. That's the the thing that staggers me. I've I've got similar experience where, in terms of just one that was not being tracked, I have seen one, and again thousands yeah. of hours, thousands of hours driving, plenty of time driving at night. Obviously, they're yeah. a nocturnal animal, um, and of course, the one I did see was broad daylight, as is off. Same with my first aardvark was completely out of schedule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. It was also in Botswana that I saw it, and the people that I called in on the radio, the who were from Botswana themselves, some from Rakops, which is a little desert area, some from a place called Jao Village, right in the middle of the Okavango, you could see that the experience was close to religious for them. Yeah, they their excitement and almost you know, heart clutching, you know, shuddering with, with adrenaline from seeing this animal, mm. was unlike their reaction to any other animal I saw in my whole career yeah. there. So yeah. you know it's that rare, and this is why it's staggering when you hear boats stopped in, uh, you know, some uh, on its way to some port in China with 10,000 tonnes of pangolins, and you think, how are they finding them? I mean, they, there's, it, it staggers yeah. me that you can actually locate that many. Yeah. <clears throat> and then being killed is such a tragedy, and it's obviously very yeah. pertinent now with the speculation that COVID came to us via pangolins or pangolins were one of the host species before it got to us. So their, their conservation is important. And, and as you said, maybe you shouldn't have touched it. Maybe nobody should. Um, yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's a very much a revered animal, you know, in, in African folklore. And, um, you know, when we brought the first pangolins here, um, I didn't know the Zulu name. I mean, I know most of the Zulu mm -hmm. names for, for all the trees and the birds and, and um, you know, I asked the staff here and some of the older staff, the, you know, the trackers that, that, that sort of have been, you know, they've been in the bush for a while and, you know, they didn't know, they didn't even know what the Zulu name was. We had to sort of reach out to sort of elder people in the uh, villages and um, to find out what was the Isi Zulu name for the pangolin, because I mean, that's how long it's sort of been out of their, their world or, um, you know, and, and Zulus, as, as most, you know, most of the tribes in Africa have names for everything, you know, for insects mm. and snakes and trees. And so that was for me quite, quite astounding, you know, and it just showed how, um, how they had been missed uh, in this part of the world. And, um, and even our staff that our, you know, most of our staff had never seen one, obviously. And um, there was such uh, 
sort of eagerness and and excitement to see a pangolin and and many of them just sort of stared at this animal because it is uh, an amazing creature um mm. you know they they they've <clears> never <throat> well seen it before it's not in books um or many books it's just a a, a creature that very few people knew about you know um so yeah it's, if, it's if there's anybody remarkable. furiously googling a pangolin is an yeah. extraordinary looking animal it does the scales make it look like an artichoke with a tail and nose and eyes and, and legs. And it's really, really rare in uh, it's bipedal walks on, yeah. on feet, holding it yeah. out. I've, I've actually seen a lovely little description that says penguins always look like they're about to deliver bad news to an evil king. Cause yes. they've always got their hands clutched forward like this. Uh, yeah. Their tail is a counterbalance. I mean, it just, <clears throat> they're one of yeah, evolution got drunk. <laughs> and said, hey, I'll give you this. Um, yeah, yeah. It's one of the strangest looking animals. Yeah, and 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 this the the, the crazy thing is, I mean, um, you know, and we've seen it here now. Is you know, if we if we weren't tracking some of them, we would never see them. We'd never find mm. them again. You know, and uh, and so people ask me, you know, how how many are left? You know, how how important are they? And actually, the questions we don't know because yeah. there is no way to. To, to count them. There's no way to, um, we've got pangolins here now that are, you know, we've released and, you know, the tags have fallen off or they've been bitten off by, you know, leopards and we don't know where they are. They've become sort of ghosts again. We call them ghosts. And, um, you know, we just don't see them. Uh, we don't see them on camera traps. Um, so, so, so no one really knows how many are left, um, yeah. you know, how many, uh, and that's, that's, I think the, um, the sort of, the significance is uh, we don't really know the impact that this sort of trafficking is having on the remaining species because we don't know how many are left. We have no way of sort of measuring does, it. That does bring up, you mentioned security. So when you were talking about the night vision, yeah, uh, there's rhinos at Pinda. So obviously, yeah. um, I mean, it is a fenced reserve and that yeah. fence is as much to keep the animals from going and raiding people's fields as it is to keep people out. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the old, whole old saying of our good fences make good neighbors. Yes. Um, obviously rhinos, uh, uh, it's well documented around the world that they're being hit. Do you think people are targeting pangolins or it's incidental? They, they've, they've come in, maybe, maybe they're just doing something more traditional. They're going to grab themselves an antelope for dinner for a couple of nights. Yeah. Um, stumble across a pangolin or do you think there's actually people out there who've got some trick that none of us have for actually finding them coming back to this idea of discovery of tons yeah 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 <laughs> it's a good question as well i mean i think in the in the sort of sandy areas uh you know in the kalahari mm. and um sort of more the western parts of zimbabwe and and even mozambique you know if you know what you're looking for you can you can follow a pangolin you can you can find it. Um, you know, most poachers, in my experience, um, in East Africa and Southern Africa, they 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 incredible bush people. You know, they they mm. they know where everything is. You know, they know where the burrows are and the water holes and the um, you know they know where to find honey. Um, I think if you spend enough time in the bush, you'll you'll come across a pangolin or you'll figure out where a burrow is. Or um, I mean, it's very hard. I think. I think a lot of the – you can't just go and say, look, today I'm going to go find a pangolin. Um, unlike a rhino or, a, um, you know, if you're going snaring, you know, you, you kind of target a species. But I think it's more incidental. Um, yeah. I think what's what's happened now in the last few years is, you know, the the, the sort of grassroots poachers, you know, the, maybe the people that are going for bushmeat or rhinos, they've – They've become aware of of the value of a pangolin, and I think these pangolins are getting trafficked along the same sort of routes, you know, the same uh, supply chains. Um, yeah. And so, if they come across a pangolin, and and you can actually hear them, uh, they're very loud at night. You know, if you're sitting quietly at a waterhole, or a um, let's say you you you're walking through the bush and you hear something rustling, you you're going to hear it. And if you go there to investigate and see what it is. You're going to find it, and then it's pretty easy to sort of walk away with. Um, so I think in the in the the sort of outside the protected areas, I think a lot of pangolins we see coming through Johannesburg and and these places are coming from 
there's still rule, you know, Mozambique and Zimbabwe and Botswana where there's still a lot of pangolins running wild, you know, outside mm -hmm. of the protected yeah. areas. So those those are getting cleaned up, you know, by by you know people that are herding cattle or you know snaring or hunting with dogs. We see a lot. Um, dogs seem to find pangolins quite quickly. You can train a dog, a hunting dog. Um, you can train quite quickly, I think, to smell out a pangolin. Um, oh wow! And okay. I think they they get. Mm. I've I've heard stories of guys finding pangolins. You know, the dogs have, you know, they've been hunting bushbuck or impala, mm. and then the dogs pick up on the scent of the pangolin, they find it, and it's maybe walking, you know, on a full moon, they find it in a ball and they pick it up. I think in the past, people would maybe just pick it up and maybe eat it or sell the scales to a witch doctor. Now they see the value, um, you know, the words got out there that, you know, if mm. they come across a pangolin, it's worth more than just cooking it up, you know. Um yeah, or, or, if, or, or selling it to the local Sangoma or witch doctor. Um, so I think definitely it's being targeted, but it's it's sort of more at this stage. I think people are getting or are, are finding them out of you know opportune opportune yeah. Um, situations. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Which is <clears throat> again, you know, this we are going through this tragedy that's now cost. Well, I know in the US it's more lives than World War One and World War Two put together. Uh, and I think Vietnam thrown in for good measure. It's more lives than that. And it does look very much like it was people handling pangolins. So you've yeah. got to wonder if demand is going to get reduced. But perhaps there's den denialism in the markets that it goes to, um, yeah. mainly China, a little bit Southeast Asia. Um, you've got to hope that the message is getting out, but we're relying on the governments there to broadcast that. And I'm not sure that they will. There's been good news. I don't know if you heard this, but just recently, China, for the first time ever, um, <clears throat> gave really long sentences to people selling yeah. ivory. It was about yeah. 15, 20 years, which is amazing. I mean, it's it's quite late in the day, but um, it's a real positive. Yeah. Some of the best news we've had in a long time. Uh, but again, coming back to something you mentioned there with East, you're talking about poachers in East Africa, Southern Africa. And there's often quite a divide between those two for some reason. It feels like I know everybody that's lived and worked in Botswana or you know, Namibia. Um, South Africa is a more crowded pool, but very rarely know the guys from East Africa. With you having worked in both of those spheres, um, and East Africa being, when well, we're talking about that from a safari perspective, mainly Kenya, Tanzania, yeah. but of Uganda and the gorillas in Rwanda yeah. and DRC, Southern Africa, we're talking South Africa and what I call the, the Batman countries, which is Botsnam, Zimzam. Um, yeah. <laughs> what do you what do you see? Are they very different in terms of conservation challenges, or are they very alike, uh, or unique to each area? What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of similarities, um, and then there's a lot of sort of fundamental differences. You know, I think. Um, Southern Africa, you know, it's very much, um, you know, I think the philosophy is on, on sustainable utilization, you know, and, 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 and conservation needs to be, you know, mankind or people need to sustainably utilize wildlife and resources in order to achieve conservation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in 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 East Africa it's quite different. It's it's very much a sort of a protectionist type um, sort of attitude or philosophy. Um, and I think that that stems from you know the, the the laws and the regulations that allow sort of people to own and and manage and and utilize wildlife. I think that's the sort of fundamental difference is. Um, and the, and the philosophy stem from that, you know, in, South, in Southern Africa, as you know, you know, for a private, in, you know, it's very easy for a private individual to purchase land and to buy a whole bunch of animals mm -hmm. and put them yeah. on and, and call it conservation, you know. And so the, the definitions are, are quite different. Um, you know, what is conservation? And I think there's, there's, there's similarities, but it, there's, there's a lot of differences. Um, yeah. I think the similarities are, the, the, the issues that we face are, are very similar. You know, there's, um, you know, growing populations uh, surrounding these sort of wild areas. And, you know, in East Africa, there's a lot more wildlife within the communities and, and the, the, the sort of wild, you know, the, the rural areas. 
But I think those populations are growing fast as well. And and then you mm -hmm. sort of get this sort of conflict um, that's developing more and more, you know, between people that are trying to eke out a, a, a living, you know, and they've got these wild wild animals around them, you know, and um, uh, so so there's that that uh, that issue or that confrontation that's building, I think, in East Africa as well. So, yeah, and I think I think East Africa as as human pop, I think the human population in South Africa is is much greater. Um, Zimbabwe is obviously a lot <clears throat> less, so you've got a lot more wild wildlife still roaming outside of protected areas, um, and and yeah, I mean. Poverty, uh, unemployment, um, you know, all of it stems from growing human populations. And, um, you know, Kenya and East Africa, you know, the modern modernization, people want, um, you know, cars and they want houses and they want material yeah. things, you know, and and that obviously often comes into conflict with, with where they live and, and the wild areas that they are supposed to sort of accept or tolerate. Um so I think the intolerance, it's that sort of sort of line where people will either tolerate wild animals or they won't, you know, and 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 what is the benefit and the incentive for them to do that? Um so I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, you know, we're sort of starting to see these sort of islands of conservation, and I see them in East Africa as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you're starting to now manage parks uh as islands, you know, because those corridors are are disappearing so yeah yeah, yeah. And, and poaching you know poaching is a problem it's it's a uh, i think wildlife documentaries are great but if there's a, a myth that they've perpetuated is this idea that africa is primarily wilderness mm. uh, and whereas of course it is it's primarily humans with yeah. as you islands is a great way to describe these islands of wilderness um, looking terrified through the fence, hoping they're, they're not overrun. And occasionally they are. Um, yeah. There's no political will to protect them or if the communities aren't benefiting. Because, yeah. of course, people are, do see the wildlife as a commodity. And if its yeah. value is greater uh, dead than alive, those people outside the fence, there's no way that they're not going to look at that yeah. and say, I'll take it. And it's not, it's not about them being bad people. They're not benefiting. Yeah. Um, which is something I'm sure you've been involved with those community initiatives. But it's interesting you say I mean, it's, it does appear to be population growth, human population growth. Um, I mean, I would add to that it's not just the human population growth in Africa. It's in the, the markets that are buying ivory, that are buying rhino horn, yeah. that are buying horn scales, um, and even bushmeat. I don't know if you've yeah. seen some statistics, how much bushmeat is going to New York from Africa. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, more from Central and West Africa, um, mm. and it is uh, part of the African diaspora there. It's a way of showing off your wealth is to yeah. serve up a baboon head or something. And, of course, it's it's actually legal. It's, it's hunted yeah. illegally quite possibly, but until <clears throat> the state of New York puts in the law to protect all of those animals, mm. it's quite legal to mm. do it. It's crazy. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, in fact, California only recently banned the trade in rhino horn. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, sorry, I, think, sorry. I think it's, yeah, and I, th I think capacity, you know, um, you know, <sighs> conservation is also often not the, uh, the priority for, 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 for African governments, you know, they, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many other sort of more pressing needs, um, you know, things like health and education and, um, you know, and, and obviously corruption is a major uh, issue, um, and that often often sort of gets in the way of of effective wildlife management. Um, and uh, you know, so where resources could be put to conservation, they obviously diverted to schools and clinics, quite rightly. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I think African governments, uh, and this is a similarity with all of them. Um, Perhaps undervalue wildlife, you know, and the value that they have, but but I think that's because, you know, it might be that uh, they cannot generate the same uh, votes or you know or or, uh, econ or or economic revenue from them. I think that's where the challenges are uh, for all of us is that we've got to somehow um, provide 
sustainable value to these wild areas for our own governments to recognize the value themselves, you know, and, um, you know, you, the most under-resourced departments are often the conservation wildlife departments, you know, they've got no vehicles, no cars. Uh, and so, you know, the men and women that are trying to protect those, those wild areas, they just, you know, their hands are tight. Um, they, yeah. you know, they, yeah. yeah. So that's, I think that's the similarity as well. And that that's right through, you know, from South Africa up to West Africa and North Africa, um, yeah. you know, completely under-resourced. Yeah. Yeah. And there's not, not a lot of political will because wildlife doesn't vote. And even yeah. if they were given the vote, I'm not sure they'd vote for a human. Uh, we haven't been <laughs> particularly kind no, they to wouldn't. that. <laughs> um, but changing tack a little bit here, with all of these experiences, these countries you've worked, what haven't you seen? I think almost everybody I know who's, who's in the field, I know you don't, you, yeah. you don't actually need safaris so much, but you're out there all the time. What is there? Is there a species that irks you, or is there um, a behaviour that you haven't seen? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's, you know, I've, I've, I've been fortunate that I've seen a lot, you know, I've seen gorillas and I've seen the, the migration and I've, you know, I've seen shubles and I, I've got sort of a mental list of things that I, I kind of want to see in Africa and, and outside of Africa as well. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I, I'll be honest, I haven't seen a, a, a chimpanzee um, in the wild. Uh, when when I went to uh, Uganda, I got sort of uh, malaria, really bad malaria, and uh, missed a part of a uh, tour that we were on. So I never got to see sort of chimps in the wild, walking in the wild. Um, I've also uh, I, I'm desperate to see an akapi. Um, oh, yeah. And then the uh, pikathati, which is a I'm not, which is a sort of a really special West African yeah. bird. I've I've tried twice in in Sierra Leone to see that and and never okay. uh, never saw it and then um, got to you know, talk to Rod Cassidy in um, Central yeah, Africa. In, yeah, yeah, he's got a spot. Uh, yeah, um, and then yeah, I've, I've sort of gone crashing through the jungle in Sierra Leone looking for a pikathati and um, never got to see one. And then yeah, uh, the manatee uh, is is okay, another. Yeah. Um, species that I would really, re I mean, these are all super rare, yeah. um, super rare animals. Um, again, Africa is the only continent that has manatees and dugongs. Yes, uh, dugongs being eastern, and manatees being being western. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, the the split distribution of them, the, and the West African yeah. manatee is a distinct species from the more familiar um, North and Central In America. Florida, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and then the ti the tiger. I mean, it's pretty. I'm sure every it's on everyone's list. Um, you know, I ne I also travelled to to India and Nepal and uh, never got to see one. I tried very hard. Um, yeah, so so there's uh, there's so much to be honest. Uh, I would I would still wanna uh, still wanna see. That's that's it, isn't it? Your, your list probably never gets shorter. Whenever you're in a place that's that you're it. new and it it spurs you on to travel more. Um, who is your conservation hero? And I, I've got an idea in mind who it might be, but I'll, I'll see. If I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, actually, I've got a. I suppose I've got a few. I've got some sort of living heroes, and then uh, a couple that um, are no longer with us. I, I would, um, I would say Dr. Ian Player is probably the one that that you had on your mind. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I think as a as a boy, I, you know, living growing up in this area, Zululand. I mean, he he was a sort of an icon, you know, and 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 obviously, uh, eventually, um, working in this area and 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 you know, working very closely with rhinos, I've got to know his story. Um, and and obviously, again, you know, I think he he's obviously portrayed as as the person that that um, you know save the southern white rhino but there was definitely again a, a, a huge team and, and and a lot yeah. of individuals with him but but i think he had this sort of vision and he was obviously the leader at the time and and so so he needs to sort of get a lot of credit for that um i think living living sort of heroes for me um 
Yeah, Doug and, and Chris Tompkins. Um, I, 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 they are with the Tompkins Conservation um, in in South America. Um, you know, they Doug is also passed on now, but but he he was the one of the founders of North Face, and right. she yeah. worked for North Face, and and um, and yeah. they started the Tompkins Trust, you know, land trust, and you know they've bought up. A lot of land in in Chile and Argentina, and and then doing some incredible work there in South America. Um, you know, rewilding huge areas and species. And um, I've had some interaction with with her, and and okay. with their team. And um, you know, I really enjoy their uh, or appreciate their philosophy, their conservation philosophy. And so I think, as as sort of living heroes, I think they or she. I mean, she's still alive now and, and, and very active in, in, their, in their conservation work. Um, I, I like their philosophy and, and, um, and, and what they're doing in South America uh, to, to bring back, you know, like we have in here and in other places in Africa, is bring back sort of, I mean, we're talking huge tracts of land. They've bought up yeah. privately, you know, and donated back to the governments there. Um, so doing incredible work in, in South America. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And it's... Again, I, I, I didn't remember the name, and you said, I've heard the story, and it does sound phenomenal. I mean, what, what yeah, an amazing yeah. way to use your wealth. I and mean, you hear these people yes. with wealth that this is working in conservation, we can't comprehend that amount of money. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I can't comprehend the cost of a burger. <laughs> so, you know, Especially that, during COVID, eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm in the UK Monday, restaurants open. Um, and I get a haircut, and it's crazy to think I live in a time where it's illegal for me to go and get a haircut. Yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, something I did want to ask you about, and I, I'm a bit all over the place today. I said last days of lockdown, <laughs> finally, and I can uncross my eyes and go blinking into the sunlight. And um, when Pinder, all this wildlife brought back in, uh, came from quite a few areas, I believe, yeah. and as you said. They brought in the elephants. They brought in the rhinos. There were still leopards there because leopards are the, the last to cling on yeah. around humanity. Um, and cheetahs were brought in. Yeah. And I remember reading way back this strange case of, I believe it was two males who were actually hunting down, killing their rivals, which is unusual with cheetahs. Normally they'll drive them off. Mm -hmm. But then cannibalizing them, which was weirder still. And mm -hmm. I remember at the time thinking, well, maybe this is as a result of the relocation. It's brought in some bizarre behaviours. But on further reflection, is, is that just bizarre for cheetahs because plenty of other species would do it? Can any animal behaviour be weird? Humans run this full range of behaviours. Mm. So is this just something, was that a one-off or is this just something that you only got, you got the chance to observe because you were so close to these creatures there that were being so monitored? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, actually, we've seen it a few times. Um, and yeah, specifically, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've had we've had males kill other other males, and um, and and start to sort of feed on them, you know. And and I mm. don't know. I think the behavior is still it's quite rare, um, and it's mm. I think the you know we always sort of try and attach a logic to it, you know. And it, what what would be the logic to it? And but I mean, we've seen it in in leopards, not here, but in other places. Um, mm -hmm. So the the thing, well, I've I haven't seen it myself, but uh, it's been recorded uh, three times here, where male, particularly males, have killed other males, and um, you know they're quite savage. You know, cheetahs they they really um, you know they they thugs. Uh, they they you know I think people have this sort of Pretty perception of a cheetah, yeah, it's it's yeah. sleek and it purrs and it's yeah. you know it's got this beautiful fur and it's it's I mean it is a pretty animal, um, but the males are incredibly savage and um, you know they 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 sort of gang up on another male and 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 literally you know kill it um, and bite it and and brutalize it to death and and I think what what sort of happens is they you know they get the taste they get into sort of this. Um, uh, what's that sort of book we all read it um you know at school Lord with of the Lord of the Flies, you know, and 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 suddenly they they get into this mob mentality and then they start to uh eat the eat the opposition. Um and some you know I've I've chatted to Dr. Luke Hunter and a few others, mm -hmm. you know, who really know their stuff and 
you know, they don't really know why, you know, it's maybe to sort of um, get the energy back that they, you know, why, why not eat it? You know, it's, it's there yeah. and lick it up and, but yeah, we've seen that. We've seen adoptions here as well, which is quite rare. Um, yeah. You know, we've had, we've had a mother die um, and, you know, her cubs were young and, and they got adopted by another mother cheetah, you know, and suddenly this mom has, Did she um, she's like mother adopted? Hubbard. So Sorry. she already she had cubs of her own. So she was yeah, and and younger cubs, you know. So you could see distinctly see that the, yeah. the age difference. So she just accepted, you know, accepted these older cubs from another, another un completely unrelated female, you know. And um, mm. yeah, so so it happens a lot. Um, I think it happens a lot in nature, as you say. It's just it's just undocumented. It's not yeah. it's not seen. I've, um, I've seen an adoption with cheetah as well, but it was. Okay. A grandmother taking on her grandson, right? Um, from her living daughter who gave it up, right? Okay. Mom. They met at a kill, uh, and it, so the let's just call it grandma. She'd had five cubs. One was killed by a martial eagle, which is unusual. Yeah. Um. So she was down to four, killed an impala, and then her daughter came out with a single oh. cub. And they all fed together. So it was a strange sight. Two adult cheetahs mm. uh, and the grandma growling at her daughter, who was fully independent. Um, four cubs about this size and one slightly bigger. Mm. And then when the daughter had fed, she walked away and her cub stayed behind. And she called to it a mm. few times and it, it, you could see it a little torn. She walked off and that was it. After that, this one that we inventively just named number five, stuck with his grandma. <laughs> And yeah. she, and Amazing. then, yeah, um, and he went from being a very shy cheetah, and her four were completely relaxed, in no time at all. He was yeah. one of those ones that jumped on, jumps on your bonnet and did that, you know, raced around. Um, I had no door on my car, and he bit me on the foot one day just playing. Uh, yeah. a really cheeky little guy, wonderful to see him do so well. But yeah, and I think again, that's it. Once you get to know these animals as individuals, and I think you've got a fairly unique opportunity there with the monitoring. Yeah, you get that much more in-depth look. It's it's something I miss. I go on a lot of safaris still, but I don't get to watch that daily soap opera. Uh, mm. It was one of the things I loved most when I lived in the Otavango for a long time in one place. Was I knew this leopard, and it's like, oh, and I know your grandma, and of course mm. your son who went off and fought that guy. He's now over there, and you you knew all of these dynasties of <coughs> um, yeah. leopards, cheetahs, lions, and um and yeah. very brutal so i mean game of thrones is nothing compared to the lives of these animals <laughs> do you yeah, do you no, still get a kick out of that as you said 30 years are you still are there still individual animals whose fortunes you follow um or are you just jaded yeah. jaded and look, it's, it, no 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 it's look it's i think you know i asked also i started off as a guide and and um mm you know, and, and, and was in the bush every day. And I think managing, managing the wildlife is quite different. You know, you kind of, you kind of have to look at things a little bit differently and maybe uh, less emotionally attached or get a little bit less emotionally attached. Um, but, but uh, there are, there are some individuals here, um, you know, that I've sort of got to know over the years, um, you know, specific rhinos um, mm -hmm. and, um, there's, you know, there was a lioness. Uh, she's no longer um, sort of here, but she, you know, where I, I saw the, you know, I saw the birth and, you know, I kind of watched, watched her sort of life, you know, right through. And she, she lived till about sort of 17, 18 years. She was very, very wow. old. Um, yeah. So it's, and yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's different. I think I, I don't spend as much time in the bush as I used to, mm -hmm. but um, there are particular animals that are, you know, if I do see them and I can recognize them, uh, there's an attachment for sure. Um, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's hard not to, you know, when you, well, you know, you, when you have a love for the bush and love for animals, it's hard to not sort of get attached emotionally to, uh, certain individuals that, you know, um, and you always enjoy seeing them, you know, because you've got a, either a shared history, you know, you kind of watch them bring up cubs or you watch them make a kill or uh, you saw them injured and, and you saw them sort of get through the injury and survive. And, 
so there is a there is definitely an affinity yeah i mean i know going back to an area called mombo that i used to live it's now the great great grandkids from my time yeah uh with with many of the species and it's just a yeah (laughs) i knew your ancestors which seems yeah (laughs) makes me very very old yeah Um, we've covered a lot of ground here which is great we've got something we like to do here is, is I think conservation so much, you said you're, you're not much for the news. I think it's because it's only the bad news. That's what it should just be called. Yeah. It's the bad news. Yeah, yeah. So we like to finish off with some good news and you've, you've touched on all the Tompkins are doing and, and I think the financial success of Pindit have taken land that was failing as an agricultural venture and as a conservation tourism venture is now profitable that's good news. What other good news do you have for viewers or listeners? Um, oof, yeah, it's always it's always easy to talk about the bad news, eh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think the good news. I, I I must say over the over the over the years, I've I've um, I've definitely seen a, a a sort of a growing sense of. Um, you know, environmental awareness, you know, what, what um, I do think, you know, it might not be uh, the right message or um, the, you know, what, what people think is the the right message, but um, there's definitely a much, uh, and I think social media and communication and and tourism has played a huge role in, in making people more, much more aware of their environment and how they impact, you know, on it, you know, and I, uh, I see kids coming now through, and you know they uh, they they're very aware of of the waste that they produce, and you know plastics and things like that. And I think I think that 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 has come from um, exposure to you know wildness and and wild areas. And tourism plays a huge role, you know. Um, so people are much more appreciative of the remaining wild areas that are are, are out there. I mean that's that's quite a big sort of um, you know, on a broad level, I think good news. Um, I think in Africa, there's there's very much a, a growing um, movement to rewild uh, areas and and to make wild areas more sort of valuable to communities and to governments. You know, there's a number of organisations and NGOs that are pushing very hard to take you know to to take wild areas back again and. Um, you know, because I think if they don't, if we don't, you know, they 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 might not turn into cities and agriculture because a lot of the wild areas left are not suitable for that. But you know, trees will get chopped down for charcoal and things like that. And um, yeah, so I think I, I think on a number of levels, you know, really sort of on a small scale, things like you know these great stories like pangolins and uh, that that keeps us motivated and 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 our good news stories that people like to see, you know, and, and, and hear and be involved in as well. Um, and then on a sort of a middle level, you know, specifically Africa, as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's, there's some amazing organizations, tourism organizations, NGOs that are doing incredible work to save, you know, and to not just save what's left, but to um, sort of recreate, you know, and rewild uh, wild areas. And then obviously on a global level, I think they're, the consciousness is is out there. I think everyone is aware that if we don't sort of look after our planet, um, we're not yeah. going to live for much longer. You know, we we've exceeded our carrying capacity. So, um, yeah. So I think there's multiple levels, um, and and those are all great stories. You know, and I think you can see it. You know, in social media and news, and people hang on to these good good news stories, and they want to contribute to them as well. And I think that's the other thing. You know, there's a lot of incredible wealth out there. And and um, mm. you know, wealthy people are, I think, also realizing that they need to contribute positively, and um, you know, if we can tap into that, and and the the sort of egos and 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 trying to get them to sort of leave a, le- leave a legacy, um, I think they they can also make a huge contribution uh, to funding uh, these sort of protected areas and wild areas. Um, but I think the big the big challenge is to get them sustainable. You know. Is to get governments yeah. to uh, to to see the value. Governments have to see the value and buy into it and protect it. Um, it's it's. I think it's finding the right models and 
and the right ways of doing it. Um, but I, I do see a lot of positive stories in Africa. You know, you just have to look around. You know, as a tourist, you can now travel to Benin. You know, who who would have thought uh, five, ten years ago you could you could go to Benin and and have an incredible wildlife experience? You know, and and that's because you know what organizations. You if, if if I jumped on, uh, what would I be looking for when I go to Benin? Well, I think you'd be looking for, you know, uh, unique species of antelope. You know, um, yes. you know different different birds. Um, you know, and 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 I think you could, you know, you could then say that you've made a contribution to what they're yes. trying to achieve there. You know, um, and I think that's that's the catch is is people need to feel that they're making a contribution, and so it's getting the story out and. When they get there, they, you know, they they leave that, you know, they leave feeling that they've, um, you know, they've contributed to the welfare or the the protection and 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 the upliftment of the communities and and you know it's it's it, it there's so many parts to it. Um, so I know I've kind of probably rambled your answer. Um, no, but, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of strands to unravel there, but they're all yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly what I asked for. Yeah. So I, I think. So yeah, the the news is so often negative, and, and Africa does seem to be the ball that the media loves to kick. You know, it's I I don't know if there's a deliberate bias, but you very very rarely see positive stories from Africa yeah. in, in international media, which is just such a pity because the, my experience is the positivity. I mean, I go right back to the original branding mistake of calling it the dark continent. You know, that's that's some guy in cloudy England came up with that. Look at the days of sunlight that you get, the yeah. colour that I've been seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think that that's it. Is that this light needs to be shone on the positivity out of Africa. Um, yeah. you, you talk about the, the awareness raising. I remember when I first came to South Africa, I was staggered at how much the general population knew about wildlife. Mm. And almost everybody went to you if you said, what are a few endangered species here? They'd say, well, there's the black rhinoceros, more endangered than the white rhino. There's a thing called the riverine rabbit, which most people don't realize is really, really endangered. And uh, most of the cheetahs, you know, and they'd start rattling them off. Yeah. And I come from Australia, um, I'm still from Australia. And uh, <clears throat> you ask, I think if you were ask Australians, 90 something percent of them could not name five endangered species from Australia. It yeah. just isn't that awareness. So to hear you saying yeah. it's on the increase is yet another positive because that is required as well, mass education. Yeah. Um, so we've taken up a lot of your time. Uh, it's the, the sun is well over the yard arm where you are. You've probably got Friday afternoon and important glasses to be raised, um, if not a bit of work to get done first. Uh, yeah, so yeah. thank you very, very much for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. Good luck with the... Continued work, you know, conservation is not a job that is done ever. It's, it's like going to the gym or weeding your garden. You've got to do it again tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so good luck with your continued efforts there. Uh, it's, it is an amazing success story. Um, and it's, as I said, more light needs to be shone on the positives. Uh, so thank you for doing that today. And um, I hope to actually join you there quite soon. There's a few things there that I'd like to see. Um, but I have not seen in my life. So I'll, I'll come and uh, have a drink with you one afternoon as well. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and you, you're most welcome. And, um, yeah, it's been great chatting. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And we'll chat again soon, I hope. Thank you.